Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, I hope you're having a great Memorial uh, Day weekend as you take time to reflect upon those who have given all, have given their, their, given their lives for, um, for our country and for our freedom. And we are so very thankful uh, for the many, many men and women uh, who have sacrificed so much for us. And I hope that you have a, a great Sunday today and a wonderful day tomorrow. If you uh, remember, we are in the Keys to a Blessed Life sermon series. And so far, uh, we focused on four things. If you want to have a blessed life, you need to preach uh, the gospel. You need to have the gospel preached to you as well. That is the key. The Word of God is a foundation for our spiritual life. And the more we get into the Word, the more the Word will get into us. The second thing that we talked about um, a few weeks ago is faith. Faith is an absolute um, key to having a blessed life. If, if we want God to bless us, we need to have biblical faith. And we looked at Romans chapter 4 where Abraham serves as the model of faith. And it wasn't that Abraham simply had belief in his mind, but that Abraham's beliefs led him to action. Uh, and we focused on two things. Number one, he believed that God could bring Sarah's womb, almost 100 years old, that was dead, back to life. That was the content of Abraham's faith, and that happened. And he had the promised child. And then the second thing that Abraham did to serve as an example was that when God wanted to uh, have uh, Abraham give him that son, Abraham was willing to sacrifice the promised child. Why? Because he believed that God could raise Isaac from the dead. And then after faith, we talked about repentance and how repentance is turning away from sin back towards God. It's an attitude. It's a mindset change where it's, it's the U-turn that we talked about. We're driving one way, living our lives for ourselves, we turn around and we walk back towards God, and that's what the Bible says that we should do, repent of our sins. Last week, we talked about baptism. This really kind of, if you're not a Christian and you've never been in church, this idea of being dunked in water uh, may be foreign and weird, but it's what the Bible teaches and how we looked at baptizo, right? The Greek word for baptism is always complete immersion of the body. It never referred to sprinkling or pouring. It was always total body immersion. And the New Testament never defined baptism as a work. Baptism, just because it was something that you did, didn't mean that it was a work earning you salvation. Um, every conversion story we looked at in the book of Acts described it as the time of salvation, the moment when you are saved, not the means. That, that was faith. And so today we're getting to the final key in our sermon series, uh, which is works. Christian works. This is an absolute key in order to have a blessed life because what you do really does matter. Um, I know that every person in this room, we make a daily decision. When we wake up and we get our days going, we make a daily decision about who we are going to be and what type of person uh, we're going to become. Whether we're going to serve the Lord, read our Bible, uh, be involved in discipleship, we make a decision. And those decisions are made on the backdrop of what we believe, right? Uh, that seems almost obvious, but what we decide to do is made on the backdrop of what we believe, what type of ideas we hold in our own mind and in our heads. And so we, I don't know about you, but we get stuck sometimes because we have a lot of really good beliefs. We have a lot of really good intentions, but sometimes what happens we come into conflict with our sin. It's like this. I can't tell you how many times I think I should buy angel flowers. Angel being my wife, right? And the thought is there. But how many times do I actually buy her flowers? Unfortunately, it's not as often as what it should be, right? Uh, we have good intentions. Why? Sometimes you want to do special things for your husbands. It might be there in your mind. But when the kids are crying, when you got to cook dinner, uh, when you're late working, I mean, sometimes it just doesn't work. And so this happens with the Christian lifestyle. We intend to follow God. We intend to do right by God, but then we all get this really big issue called sin. Sin creeps into our life, it becomes a habit, and uh, it's, it's not the person that we want to be or become. And so if you'll turn into James chapter 2, that's going to be the primary text of, our, uh, of reading this morning. And James is dealing with a, a church that wants to do the right thing. Um, this church is probably a lot like Severn. Uh, they are really about preaching the word of God and hearing the word of God. They want to do the right thing. Um, but sometimes, right, sometimes you don't follow through. Sometimes you hear the word a lot, but when it comes to doing the word, 
we make mistakes, we mess up, we fall short. And I don't know about you, but that's so true for me. And that's why I say the book of James is a lot like Severn, because the book of James is a lot like me. And it's probably a lot like you as well. And so in James chapter 1, uh, just as a quick review, James says, look, I don't want you just to hear what the word of God says. I want you to actually do what it says. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers, he says. And then when he gets to the second chapter, um, he says it's really easy to be religious in our mind, but controlling your mouth is where the rubber hits the road. And many of you may have even cursed at somebody on the road because they were being a knucklehead or something like that, maybe. Maybe you got in a fight with your spouse uh, or a yelling match with your kids when it comes to church or attending church. Maybe you just thought bad thoughts about coming to church and those bad thoughts ended up coming out of your mouth. And James deals with this issue that is extremely relevant for all of us. We have a theoretical religion in our mind, but when it comes to the speech in our mouth, that really defines what we're all about. And so as he works through this idea of Christian works, he comes down to this really kind of split in, in the road. Theoretical religion versus dynamic faith. Theoretical religion, the ideas and the beliefs, versus dynamic faith. And, and so that's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. If I could define the two, I would say dynamic faith is someone who believes the truth and obeys the truth. Somebody who has theoretical religion talks a big game about what is right, but lacks obedience. And so when we tackle this idea of the difference between dynamic truth and th theoretical, theoretical religion, James asks us to do something. Have a faith that is alive. Have a faith that works. In fact, as we'll see in our text, he goes on to say this. Faith without works is dead. It's like a dead body or something that is no longer alive and living. And so that's why what we do really does matter when we approach this subject of, of faith and works. Now, let me just remind you. We looked at John chapter 6, verses 28 through 29, and talking about this idea of what a work is. And some people define work as just anything that you do, right? But when we look at the New Testament, that's not how Paul uses the term work. Work isn't just simply anything that you do. Work is anything that you do in response to God's law, which is why baptism isn't a work. So everything that we're going to be talking about this morning are things that you should be doing in response to God's law code that we call the new law. There are two types of laws that are written about in the Bible. You've got the Mosaic law, which is the old law, the Ten Commandments, right? A lot of us try to keep the Ten Commandments. And if you try to earn your salvation by keeping the Ten Commandments, you're going to mess up. You're going to fall short. Then we have what's called the moral law in Romans chapter 2. We all have this law written on our hearts that we choose to obey or disobey. This morning, we're going to be talking about uh, the Christian law or the New Covenant law or the New Testament law that many of us have in our Bibles. So if I could put it in a key phrase, I'd say this. For Paul, a work or a work of law is any deed, external or internal, sinful or righteous, done in response to the law code that God has given us as his creator uh, and we as his creatures. So in James chapter 2, verse 14, let's, let's start there. He says here in verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go, be in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. You see, for James and for the apostles, faith wasn't merely something that you held in your mind. It wasn't this mystical, theoretic ideology or doctrine. Faith was a belief that led to action. And you cannot look back at your life and say, I've been a faithful person if there is no action to accompany uh, that faith. For instance, Abraham, he was called a man of faith, a faithful man. Why? Because he could point back to his life and he could look at moments along his life where he obeyed God. He left the land of Ur. Uh, he went into the promised land. He continued to have a relationship with Sarah in such a way that would bring a promised child. He was willing to give Isaac, the promised child, back to God in a sacrifice. 
and, and God ended up stopping him and told him that it was just a test to see whether or not he was a true follower of him. And so I want you to think about yourself. What are some key moments that you could look back to in your own life and say, man, that is a moment where I followed, where I trusted God. For a lot of us, it is this baptistry right here, that that was a key moment where we look back on our life and we said, that was the moment where I said, I trust God. For many of us, it was going back to restore our marriage that was broken and maybe on a path to divorce. Maybe it was a time where we chose to put down a bottle or we chose to stop smoking a joint or we chose to stop listening to intoxicating music. A a like decision that was for our own better glory to God. I don't know what that is for you, but I want you to think about that. When have been those key moments where you've decided to stop doing something or start doing something in order to follow God? Those are definitive moments of faith. And that's what James is saying to look at. Look at those moments and decide whether or not you are a person who walks and lives by faith, which is determined by your works. And so if there is no physical activity of the body and rational intellect of the mind, one does not have biblical faith. And let me give you a perfect example. I have a terrible fear of heights. Like if I go to climb on those rock climbing walls, like you could go over to... um, Uh, The mall over in Hanover and at the Bass Pro Shop, they have that big rock climbing wall. I get about three feet up and my legs start shaking. It's ridiculous. I'm like, I'm such a wimp, (laughs) you know? I'm like, I don't like to look at stuff. I stay like five feet away from the edge of a cliff. There's this safety protective zone that I have put for myself because you never know what could happen, right? I mean, you could slip and roll for some reason. I don't know why. But you never know what could happen. The wind could blow. And so I get really scared of heights. I do ride roller coasters, but I close my eyes, so, you know, I don't see, and uh, I know, it's pathetic. Anyways, so here's what, here's what biblical faith is, right? So imagine that we are on this really tall cliff, and, uh, and there's this long wire that goes across from one side to the other. There are crazy people who actually do that, by the way. They have these really long balancing sticks, and they walk across metal wires. I don't really know why or what's the point, but they do it. And so imagine that you have watched God put people into a wheelbarrow, and he has pushed them across that line a thousand times, right? And somebody comes up and asks you, and they say, do you believe that God could do it a thousand and one? And you would say, yes. Why? Because you believe that God can do it based on what you've seen and what you've experienced. Now, here's faith. Faith isn't just watching God do it. Faith is getting into the bucket and letting God push you across that line which requires trust. It requires action. And so that's what the New Testament writers meant about faith. It's rational intellect with action of the body that leads us to actually do things. And so can a workless faith save a person? That's a question. Can a workless faith save a person? And James says resoundingly, no. Just because you intellectually believe something, the Bible says, does not mean you are saved. And so a key phrase that I would focus in on is simply this. Faith is the belief that. Faith is the belief that. It's the content of our faith. And James actually gives us a really good example, as we'll see. But we believe, for instance, we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We don't just believe that God is one or that God is the creator, or that God is all-powerful. We believe specifically that God can bring life from non-life. Abraham believed that same thing. That's what Romans 4 says. The content of Abraham's faith was creationism. God could bring a dead womb back to life. God could bring a dead son back to life. And so that's why Abraham serves as the model of our faith. So we are in the life business, not the dead business. We are in the reality business, not the metaphysical, mystical realities of the mind. We believe that God can bring dead marriages back to life. We believe that God could bring a dead family full of hate and animosity back to love. We believe that God can bring a dead career back on purpose. We believe that God can take a dead church and bring it back to life again with passion. We believe that God could make a dead heartbeat alive with hope and purpose. We are in the life business. And so the content of what you believe about God will determine the actions that you have in your life. And that will ultimately determine the type of faith that you have. Look at verse 18 of James chapter 2. He says, but someone may well say, 
you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. He is saying, here's the content of your faith that is workless. You believe that God is one. You have a belief that God exists and that God is one God, not in a plurality of God. So they believe in monotheism. But look at what the analogy he gives us. You do well, the demons also believe and shudder. They, they, they shake with fear, so to speak. Even demons who are condemned as spirits to eternal hell and suffering and torment believe that God exists. The content of their faith, so to speak, is the oneness of God. And James says, even though you believe in God, that doesn't mean that you're saved. So you can see why works serve as such an important key to Christianity and having a blessed life. It not only defines who we are as a person and as a Christian, but it refines and shapes us. It makes us the person that God wants us to be. And so when we preach the gospel of life, we preach a gospel that is full of hope and possibility to make things right again. But having a faith without works, he says in verse 17, is dead. Here's the Greek word for dead. It's nekros. This refers to a lifeless, dead body. And some Greek definitions are simply this. A dead corpse, lacking life, unable to respond to impulses or perform functions. So here's what a dead faith looks like. You were to sit in here on Sunday morning. You were to hear the message that is being preached. You were to leave here and do nothing about it. Here's what a dead faith looks like. You were to hear the gospel, believe, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name. But when it comes to actually doing it, you don't. Here's what a dead faith looks like. You hear that the Bible says that you should be full of love and compassion, speaking the truth in love, but you leave here and you don't do it. When the Bible says things like be gentle and kind to one another, be compassionate to each other, love one another and encourage one another, and you leave here and you don't do it, that is a dead faith. When the Bible talks about prayer, fellowship, Bible reading, serving, fasting, when the Bible says these things, a dead faith will leave this room and not do it. And so that's why the content of your faith really does matter because it determines the type of person that you are. James says in James chapter 2, verse 20, he says, but are you willing, he asks him this question, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, you person who, who was lost, who was lacking understanding, are you willing to recognize that faith without works, he says, is useless? The Greek word for useless here is argos. It means inactive. It means to be idle, lazy, thoughtless, at leisure, in your comfort zone, shunning the labor that one ought to perform. I like that definition. Shunning the labor that one ought to perform. Importantly, it's unresponsive to life-giving influences and opportunities pertaining to the things of God. So it's as if God is there trying to resuscitate you and you're unresponsive. It is like a person who just wants things to come into their life, like, like lazy people, for instance, who don't want to work. Self-entitled people uh, who think that everything in life should be a handout to them uh, and that they don't have to do anything for it, right? That's, that's what's so great about the American principle, the American dream, so to speak, is that we are a nation who is founded on people who are willing to do and not just want, to willing to go out and work for what they have, uh, to make a living, to not expect a handout, to surround people with a community of, of helping and thankfulness, but at the same time, doing everything that they could do in order to have a wonderful, blessed life. That's, that's the idea here. And so that's why America is recognized as a great nation. It's because it's recognized as a nation where people are willing to do. And that's something that we should fight for in American values and in an American system. We should resist the temptation to create a society in which people are used to not doing and just receiving. And that really reflects the nature of the church. We need to be a group of individuals who are willing to do and not just listen. You see, the Bible is a tool. The Bible is a tool to equip you in such a way that you can go be. Give up who you are and go be the person that God wants you to be. So some of the ways that this word was used for useless, right? It's like having a field of corn and you plant the corn, and then nothing pops up. Isn't that so disappointing? You know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's one of the most disappointing things. It's like eating a vegan burger. 
You know, it's like you're expecting real meat, and somebody smushed up vegetables and calls it a burger. Like, that is ridiculous. You know, my wife, by the way, she doesn't, she doesn't eat meat, and so we have this constant, you know, battle in our house where she makes fun of me and I make fun of her, and so I can say stuff like that, okay? Like, I'm privileged. But, uh, but yeah, so even Piper, I feel so bad for Piper. She's not eating meat. She doesn't want to eat it. And so she's taken after her mother, and so, you know, she's going to have some spakings coming down the pipe. Uh, if she doesn't eat meat with me, I'm just kidding. That would be terrible. I'd be a horrible father, right? That would be off- absolutely awful. But anyways, it's like not what you expect. It's, it's used like this. And, and I love Christmas Vacation. And like the older you get and you, you watch the movie over and over again, you're like, wow, this is actually really kind of a bad movie, you know? Like <laughs> only heathens should watch this stuff. But one of my favorite characters is Cousin Eddie. And if you do not know who I'm talking about, I think that you're probably a sheltered person uh, who has really missed out on what life has to offer. But if you don't know anything about Cousin Eddie, he's this totally, like, awkward, weird, barbaric person who, like, burps and does other weird stuff. And, uh, you know, he's, like, standing outside the house, and it's wintertime, and he's in his bathrobe smoking a cigar, and he's emptying his RV tank into the sewer. I mean, that's the, that's the type of person that we're talking about here. And so, Cousin Eddie didn't get anything for his kids for Christmas. Like, he is a complete jerk. And, uh, and he's a terrible father. And um, anyways, it's, it's a long story. But Cousin Eddie's one of my favorite, right? Not because I, I identify with Eddie, of course. <laughs> Just because he's a funny character. And he's gone eight years without having a job. Eight years, yeah, in the movie. Eight years he's gone without having a job. And so Clark, who's the main character of the story, is talking with his wife, and he's like, really? Eight years without having a job? And she says this. She says, and here's, how, here's the dialogue. In seven years, actually, sorry, it's seven. In seven years, he couldn't find a job, and Catherine, his wife, says this. Well, he says he's been holding out for a management position. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? I'm just going to not work because I'm a manager. I got top quality here, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to not work until I can have a management position. A.K.A. he's lazy. He doesn't want to work. He's not being the person, the father, the husband that he should be in providing for his family. That's the idea about a useless faith. Uh, That's what the Bible conveys. It's inactive. It's lazy. And so if we are willing to recognize that what we believe can become useless and active or dead without works. It should radically change the way that we live. And so if you could give this comparison in the scripture, Eddie is a demon, so to speak. He's got good ideas in his mind, but when he comes to actually doing something, he's useless, he's inactive, he's he's a dead father, so to speak. And so the demons demonstrate negatively what Abraham and Rahab demonstrate positively. And so our text actually uses Abraham, the motto of our faith for what we should be. Look at verse 21. It says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that a faith was working with his works as a result of the works, and faith was perfected. It's like a a computer program, right? If you've got 85% download, you don't have the whole thing. The program's not going to run right. You're going to have missing components in the program. Uh, It's like these games now. You know how ridiculous it is to buy a video game and then find out you can't even play the game because you have to spend another $100 on stuff? Like that's A lot of you are like, I don't play video games. I have no idea what that's about. How about this? We buy picture programs on our phone, for instance. And you can make all these wonderful edits to your picture, a.k.a. if you spend $100 on filters in order to make the pictures that you want. That's the same type of idea here. It's like going to the car, right? Going to the car manufacturer and finding out you can get a basic shell for a basic price. It doesn't even do what you want it to do. That's, that's what he's saying here. And so faith, what we believe and who we are, is perfected. It's made complete. It's a total download. It's everything that we were meant to order by our works and what we do. Verse 23, he says, The scripture was fulfilled in which it says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned, declared, imputed, spoken is what this means to him as righteousness. And what happened? He was called God's friend. And so James says, look, look back at Abraham's life. 
That moment when he was willing to sacrifice Isaac on the altar to God, God says, you are righteous. I am giving you my righteousness because of what you did. That's what the Bible says when it comes to this idea of faith. Not just believing, but doing. And so James ends verse 24 with this. You see that a man is justified, declared righteous by works and not by faith alone. A lot of people have struggled with this passage uh, because they have this very strong idea of grace and faith. And this idea that we're not just saved simply by believing certain things is quite radical and difficult for people to understand and accept. And I can understand this tension. But here's what our works do after we become a Christian. Every time we pray, every time we fellowship, many of you have done a good work this morning, whether or not you believe that. Some of you came to Sunday school. Every single person has showed up here to hear a sermon. That is a good work. That's doing a good thing. At the end of service, we're going to pass the offering and give back to God. That's a good work. That is a good thing. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. That is a good work. We're going to pray. Every time we do things like this, It points back to our baptism that says, yeah, that was legitimate. That was real. That was saving faith. Why? Because of what we are doing. Because of who we are. And that's what James means by this. So we have good news. The good news is that while our good works don't earn our salvation, they do confirm that our salvation was real. It was legitimate. And so that's why James can say, I will show you my faith by my good works. And so here's really good news, everyone. God doesn't require your perfection. He gives it to you. What God requires is your faithfulness. God doesn't require you to be perfect. He wants you to be, and he requires you to be faithful. That means every time you fall down, he wants you to get back up. Every time you make a mistake in sin, he wants you to to make that mistake right by doing good things. He wants you to constantly be in a relationship with him. He wants you to become the best person that God knows you can be, that God planned for you to be by your good works. And so somebody who lives a life of faith, somebody who is a Christian who follows after God, will be somebody who is completely and totally imperfect, but tries to be the best person that they possibly can be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let me give you seven things to end this morning, and they're not going to be very long. They're actually quite short and simple, that you can do that are going to be good works that God wants you to do. Here's the first thing, prayer. You see, Abraham was called God's friend. Do you know any friends that never talk to each other? Like, we all have friendships that we built in high school and that maybe we built in college and that we heard earlier on in life, but friends establish friendship over what? Communication. Uh, You become friends by talking to each other. And so if you are God's friend, what is something that you should do? You should be talking to God. That's what prayer means. Prayer means literally God talk. And so that's a good work that you can do. Make that your ambition every day. That when you leave here, you're going to pray. You're going to talk to God every single day. That's a good work that you can do. Here's the second thing. What do friends do? They understand each other, right? And I have a tendency, as normal preachers do, to talk. And I can talk a lot. Sometimes when I counsel or uh, when I'm just hanging out with someone, I'm just like, just jibber-jabbering away, and the person's sitting there nodding their head and shaking, and then it clicks. I'm like, wow, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> and, but but that's, God wants to talk to us, and that's what friends do, right? They talk to each other. And so reading the Bible, reading the Bible every single day is giving God the opportunity to talk to you. It doesn't have to be a whole lot. You don't have to read the book of Leviticus or go home and read the book of Matthew. You know, just even having just Bible reading every single day. As you talk to God, let him talk back to you. Number three, fellowship. I think friends do this. They submit to one another. I mean, maybe you've had one-sided friendships before, right? Where you're the person that is only ever doing for them and they're never really doing for you. If you want to hang out, it's got to be on their terms. Go to their house, do what they want to do. But friendship isn't like that. And friendship with God isn't like that. You see, God isn't just this toy in heaven that we get to use for our advantage when something goes wrong. Uh, We, each other in this room, we're not just here for the sake of being manipulated and used by each other. We're here to fellowship. We're here to, to fellowship with each other. And that means that we spend time to one an- with one another and we submit to one another. We help each other out. 
That is a good work that you can do. And we have dozens of opportunities for you to fellowship. If this is your first time here, uh, even though our life groups are getting ready to end for the summer, getting plugged into a life group, if you wanted to, you could do something every single day of the week at Severn Christian Church, being connected to each other. Number four, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper comes from this idea of communion. The essential word, the idea is community. And so friends eat together. And we're getting ready to do that. We are going to eat with each other, uh, making intentional time every week to share a meal. Uh, The reason why husbands and wives can be friends is because they share time together. When you don't share time together, you've missed it. Number five, uh, friends will serve. They'll do good to each other. I like this verse in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul encourages the church. He says, so then, while we have every opportunity, let us do good to all people. All people, especially to those of the household of faith. So here's the good news about your relationship with God. It's not restricted to people like us. We are commanded to do good to everyone. That, that is our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, people we work out with at the gym, people we meet uh, when we are participating in our hobbies. Wherever you are doing good works and serving other people is a good work that God wants you to do. And so our text, if you'll remember, what did it deal with? Food, clothing, caring for the basics of of people's lives. That's what God wants from us. And so there are a lot of ways that you can serve, not just out in the community, but uh, you can volunteer for a ministry. We've got several ministries that you can get plugged in, tech ministry. We need communion cleanup. We cannot eat together unless people are willing to prepare it and clean up after service. And We have a big opening. There are several openings that you can get plugged into in order to just help clean up once a month, once every two months. And a lot of the information is not only in your bulletin, but it's posted at our our connection center. It's posted on the bulletin boards of the walls outside the office. You can get plugged in and do good works if you want to. We have Hope for All, uh, which sorts clothes and clothing and furniture, and they actually will go to people's houses who have had terrible life circumstances. We're talking about the people who slip through the cracks, right? People who, don't, uh, who make too much money to get government assistance, but not enough money to even take care of themselves. And so one of the ministries that we support here is a nonprofit organization called Hope for All. We have donations that you can bring to the church. They have a huge warehouse uh, run by an ex-teacher. He served in the teaching community for all of his life, and now he started this nonprofit organization for free. And he will go into a person's house and fully furnish it and give clothing. And he's just all about helping people, and it's a Christ-based organization. They share the gospel with people as well. We serve Arundel House of Hope. Uh, Every year we host Winter Relief, and many of you are familiar with this, where people who literally would die if they were out in the winter come into our church, and we feed them, we house them, we give them the ability to clean up after themselves and take care of themselves so they don't have to suffer in the wintertime. We have this building where we have, thankfully, a lot of people who put a lot of time into making things work so that we could have uh, sermons and classes and we can fellowship together. Grounds help, classes. I mean, there are so many ways to get plugged in and actually do and serve. These are good works that God wants you to do. Number six, and this is one that we do not preach on nearly enough, is meditation. Psalms chapter 19, verse 14 says this. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, friends, they'll give undivided attention to each other. I've got two pictures that I want to show you before we uh, close out today. The first picture is a group of individuals sharing a meal together with their undivided attention. Right? You'll literally look look up these pictures online, and this is so true. Uh, I, I read a quote the other day, spend time with people that will make you not want to look at your phone. Right? Spend time with people that make you not want to look at your phone. And that's what the idea of the Christian community should be. Now, I'm not saying all the phones are of the devil. You know, that's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what we're saying here. But what we are saying is spend intentional time with each other. Get out of a book. Get out of a phone. Just get away from the TV and focus on, on God. Meditate. I like to think of it like this, right? Listening to the Word of God is like eating a nice juicy steak or burger, a.k.a. non vegan 
But meditating is taking a bite and chewing on it and letting those flavors just hit every taste bud in your mouth and really thinking about how delicious and wonderful it is. I'm having burgers on Monday, by the way. Really excited about it. I hope you are too. Uh, The Bible does say in Romans chapter, I think it's 15, that if you don't eat meat, you have weak faith. So I'm just saying, I'm just kidding. It actually does say that, but I'm just kidding. It's, It's not in the way that you think I said it was. All right, so here's number two, right? This is a really funny meme uh, that we have up here. Hey, let's get together and hang out so we can spend uh, time on our phone. Like, that's literally what relationships become now. People spend time together, and they're just on their phone. But meditation is really contemplating and focusing on God's word, spending three or four minutes a day focusing on one word, one scripture, really chewing on the substance of, of God's word. And then here's finally, number seven is fasting. You know, the Bible does say when you fast, not if you fast. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time and you've never deprived yourself of something intentionally to seek God's face, you're really missing out. Jesus said this, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What this means is, is that you shouldn't post to Instagram, hey everyone, doing a 24-hour fast, just want to let you know. It's not calling up your buddies and saying, hey, I'm fasting today, so I'm not going to be able to come over. It's living your life in normal ways, depriving yourself of maybe food, uh, maybe social media, do a 30-day fast from social media, giving things up that you may see God's face. These are seven things that you can do, good works that you can leave here today to draw near and close to God. And so what's the point? What is the point of all of this? What is the point of good works? Well, as we've said this morning, it's to look back at your baptism when you obeyed the gospel at that moment and say, that was saving faith. My life has been different. My life has been changed. Uh, I, I'm not the same. And so it's living your life, validating that you really do have saving faith. But good works do something else. The Bible has this idea of iron sharpening iron, And what your good works do is it chips away at your sinful nature, controlling it, confining it, ultimately doing away with it to the point to where your life is now living in the glory of God and it's no longer bound by your sin and your struggles and your temptations. One of the most important things that I've ever learned in Christianity is this. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. If I'm busy doing the works of God, I won't be busy doing the works of the flesh. And so if we are really focused on working for God and we are intentional about overcoming our sinful nature and our weaknesses, we can be the person that God created us to be. In honor of Memorial Day and people who have sacrificed their life um, for our country, for our freedom, uh, one of my favorite military uh, leaders to read about is Eisenhower. Eisenhower, if you don't know, had an extremely uh, crazy temper. And he struggled with it for the majority of his life, even uh, into the military and into politics. Eisenhower had this one really definitive moment in his childhood. Uh, It was on Halloween, and uh, he and his brothers, um, they wanted to go trick-or-treating, but his mother told little Ike that he was too young in order to accompany his brothers. And so in a fit of rage, as any normal sane kid would do, he ran up to a tree and he punched it as hard as he could. This is, this is actually what happened. And it literally took all of the skin off of his knuckles. And so as any little boy would do, uh, he cried and went to his mom. And his mom sent him to his room where he spent an hour bleeding from his hand uh, in complete misery. And that's what his anger led to. And he was completely beside himself with rage. And after this hour, mom came up and she bandaged his wounds and she took care of him. And she said this. And he says, this is something that I have always remembered. And it was a proverb from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. He that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who takes a city. It's a really powerful proverb. Ike said this. Hating was a futile sort of thing. uh, Recalling what his mother had told him. Because hating anyone or anything meant that there was little to be gained. The person who had incurred my displeasure probably didn't care, possibly didn't even know, and the only person injured was myself. 
You see, what Eisenhower recognized about these temptations, these battles, is that if he wasn't intentional about overcoming them, they would rule and reign over his life. And one of the ways that he would deal with his, with his anger, uh, as you can imagine, being in the military and, and, and fighting our enemies, is that when something that would happen uh, that would displease him and he would feel really angry, he would get out a piece of paper, he would write that person's name down, and then he would put it in the drawer. And that was a way that he would actually deal with his anger. And he had other techniques. But the point is simply this. In doing good works, in order to have a blessed life, we have to be intentional about being the person that God wants us to be. Without it, our sinful nature will win. If we aren't busy doing spiritual things, our life will be overwhelmed and crowded with sinful things. And that's why we have to be determined. We have to be set. I'm going to leave here today, and I'm going to be intentional about living my life for Jesus Christ. We're getting ready to pass around the offering. This is going to be a time where you can give back to God uh, or communicate with the office with a connection card. If you want to learn more about becoming a Christian, we, we want to encourage you to, to mark off getting baptized or becoming a member and put that in. And we have a team that will follow up with you. Uh, or even if you just need prayer uh, or you need encouragement, communicate that to us with the connection card. But if you want to make Jesus Lord over your life, uh, after we pray, we're going to invite you to do that as we sing a song of invitation. And there's no greater thing that you can do than to give your life to Jesus, turn away from your sin, and be baptized in his name. So I'm going to ask that you stand and pray with me. Lord, uh, we just thank you, uh, Father, for loving us and for dying for us. And God, I pray that as we pass around this offering, Lord, as we take this moment to give a portion back to you, God, that there'll be a person here or many people who have thought about this life that they've lived who hasn't obeyed the gospel and that they'll be willing to do that, Lord, that they'll be willing to turn away from their sin, knowing, God, that they need your perfection, they need your grace because they can never earn it or deserve it. God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for sending your son to die for us. God, thank you for cherishing our relationship and living in such a way that we could live with you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.